Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 2017 Marvel film, Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, this is the second reboot of the Spider-Man franchise in a span of not even 10 years, because the first Sony reboot, The Amazing Spider-Man, came out in 2012. So here we are in 2017... And all it has been has been five years since The Amazing Spider-Man, and here we have another reboot. Now, unlike The Amazing Spider-Man, this isn't really your typical origin story, so it doesn't really focus on Peter getting bit by a spider and all this stuff with Uncle Ben and so on. So it does feel fresh in that regard. Um, overall, I would say I didn't love this movie as much as a lot of other people did. But it's a movie that kind of crawled on me after I saw it uh, more than once. And, you know, kind of crawled up my sleeve and just kind of hung around there for a little bit. And I was like, hey, you know, all right, you can hang. I'm all right. You can hang with me, homeboy. Okay, we're cool. We're cool, homecoming. All right. Um, I would say I like the film okay, but I definitely cannot. I definitely did not love the movie. And I was, this is not going to be like one of my favorite films of the year. I would say it's one of the weaker Marvel films that I've seen in the MCU, but it's still a entertaining movie. It's a film that I could definitely see being a time waster for me. Uh, and overall, it's a little bit disappointing, a tiny bit disappointing considering all of the hype that it got. All these just 90, 93% Rotten Tomatoes. A lot of people saying it's like the best Spider-Man movie to date. And I just felt that there were some great elements to this, but overall, I really do feel something like Spider-Man 2 is a better Spider-Man movie uh, than than this was. And actually, I did like The Amazing Spider-Man 2 more than Homecoming. I know. Go ahead and web me. Go ahead and you just, you know, web me up and sling me around. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, I'd rather be honest than lie to people. Uh, and that's my honest feelings on uh, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It's got flaws, but, you know, I will take those flaws. And and uh, over this movie, which honestly plays a lot of things way too safe. Now, Spider-Man Homecoming is directed by John Watts, who, before this, directed something called Cop Car. It's a film that I don't really think looked that great so I never really saw the movie it didn't really interest me that much so I never really got around to seeing the film now his direction to me personally is definitely one of the weaker aspects of this movie but I'll talk about that later because I want to split this review up into what I liked about the film what I didn't and then give my final rating on the movie now John Watts directed the film uh, and it has a screenplay by a, just a whole slew of fucking writers you got Jonathan Goldstein, John Francis Daly, John Watts, Christopher Ford, Chris McKenna, Eric Summers. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six writers. Six people came up with this script. I, I, wow. Uh, this definitely did not need six writers. And maybe they should have hired some other writers. Uh, maybe two more or, or fired some of the other ones. Uh, this actually felt like it could have used more writing. And that's shocking considering it has six writers. Ba it's based on a story by Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. It stars Tom Holland as Peter Parker, uh, Spider-Man, Michael Keaton as Adrian Toomes slash the Vulture. Uh, John Favreau reprises his role as Happy from the Iron Man films. You also have a little cameo by uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is back as Pepper Potts, which I wasn't really expecting her to really return to the franchise, considering how everything with her kind of ended in Iron Man 3, but it's, it was really nice to see her again. Uh, Zendaya, who is a Disney Channel star, she's in this as Michelle, a.k.a. MJ, whether that stands for and Mary Jane or not, I don't know. But regardless, not a fan of her character. I'll talk about that later. Donald Glover has a bit role as like one of these like thugs. This this guy who's uh, trying to buy weapons from tombs as men, 
and then he ends up helping Spider-Man out later, gives him the location of where Toombs' next uh, deal is going to be uh, on the ferry. Marissa Tomei is in this as Aunt May. She was introduced in Civil War, as well as Tom Holland. Uh, it's definitely a different uh, casting choice uh, for Aunt May. Because for the most, you know, Aunt May is not known for being a MILF. <laughs> for being this just absolutely smoking hot uh, chick. She's, a, she's known for being the older, you know, sort of grandmother type of character. And honestly, I like Marissa Tomei a lot. So, uh, and it wasn't just because she was eye candy. She's a very talented actress. And and I thought she was definitely one of the positives for the film for me. Robert Downey Jr. has, uh, has a few uh, scenes in this as Iron Man, Tony Stark, who becomes uh, a mentor to, uh, to Tom Holland's uh, Peter Parker. So in a lot of ways, Uncle Ben has been replaced with uh, Tony Stark. And I think it actually works. I, I was worried about this sort of dynamic not working that well. And I was worried that this film was going to be like Iron Man 4 because the, Tony Stark was going to be in it too much. That's actually not what happened, though. Surprisingly, that's not really what ended up occurring at all, at least for me personally. You also have some other cast members... Uh, you have Jennifer Connelly, who actually provides the voice of this computer that's inside Spider-Man's new suit, named Karen, uh, which I thought, I didn't really recognize her voice, so uh, that's actually a pretty cool piece of trivia. Uh, Bokeem Woodbine and Logan Marshall Green, they play different incarnations of the Shocker, Herman Schultz and Jackson Bryce. Uh, Michael Mando appears in a brief role as Mac Gargan, who eventually might go on to become Scorpion. Uh, because that's the alter ego of uh, Scorpion is, is Mac Gargan. Uh, Michael Chernus plays uh, Phineas Mason, also who's also known as the Tinkerer. Uh, Hannibal Bolt Burris has a little uh, cameo role as a, as a coach, this uh, a gym teacher for Midtown High. Uh, you also have um, this uh, newcomer, this new kid. Um, he plays... Uh, Jacob Balaton plays uh, Peter Parker's best friend, Ned, who I fucking hate. I hate this character with a passion. He, I absolutely loathe Ned. I loathe nerdy Ned with every fiber of my being. This character was so annoying. He was so terrible. He alone is one of the reasons why this film is just average to me. Why it's just okay. Because of him. Because of his fucking fat ass. I'll talk about that later. In the negatives. In the cons section of this review. But anyway, Jacob Balaton plays uh, Peter Parker's best friend, Ned. Um, you also have uh, Laura Harrier, who plays Liz. Liz Allen, who is uh, Peter's crush, his love interest. Uh, Tony Revol Revolori plays uh, Flash Thompson. I don't know why they decided to go with this route. I have no idea. Uh, instead of being a jock, he's just this nerdy kid who's just jealous of Peter and is saying witty lines like "penis." When I when you say Parker, you say, when I say Parker, you say "penis," 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 "Parker," "penis," "Parker." You know, just like really. <laughs> And then he, like, smacks Peter on the ass for some reason in one scene, which I'm just like, what? Is that what bullying is now? Just smack you right on the ass. A hard smack on the ass. Like, what? 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 I just found him annoying. I really did. I, it was just, like, it was just annoying. Flash Thompson, to me, was never really an annoying character. And I, and I don't really see... And, and what really... It's a missed opportunity to have Flash evolve, like he has in the comics where he becomes, actually becomes a friend of Peter's as, you know, Peter gets older. So it's like one of those things, it's like, well, he kind of threw that out the window with this character. And apparently you have uh, Angry Rice plays a character named Betty Brant, which I'm like, I did not, I don't remember this character in, in the film. Um... Yeah, it's one of those things I'm just like, what? I, I don't... Betty Brant. I, I know Betty Brant. Betty Brant is, is uh, one of the first love interests that Peter had. He, he, uh, 
Oh, okay. Oh, it's the girl from, uh, the blonde girl from the Nice Guys. She's Betty Brandt? Okay, interesting. Is, 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 is she going to be Peter's next love interest after this movie? Huh. Okay. You also have Kirk Thatcher, who was the punk in Star Trek IV, uh, The Voyage Home, the one where he's playing his music really loudly on the bus, and Spock goes in and gives him the Vulcan nerve pinch and knocks him out, and the whole bus is like, yeah, that guy's in this movie. And he plays a punk as like a homage to his role in Star Trek Four. I had no idea that was the case. I, next time I see this movie, I'm going to be on the lookout for him. There's a Star Trek Four Easter egg in Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, yeah, I think that's really cool. And of course, you have your typical Stan Lee cameo as you have in every Marvel movie, pretty much. You have music by Michael Giacchino, which I actually liked. I love the Vulture theme, um, and I like the main heroic theme they have for Spider-Man. I even liked the instrumental uh, version they did of an orchestral uh, remix, you know, an orchestra remix of uh, the Spider-Man, Spider-Man, you know, so they did a, re a remix of that with an orchestra in the opening to the film. And it was actually really cool. I wish they it was in the film more, though. Like, it was only there, like, in the beginning, and then that's it. You know, when they have the Marvel logo show up. And it was, that was just kind of disappointing. Um, feature cinematography by Salvatore Totino. Uh, no, no, relation, no relation to Totino's Pizza. <laughs> Edited by Dan Lebenthal and Debbie Berman. And it's a film that costs about $175 million, and it made about $588 million so far in the box office. They'll probably end up making more than that. So far, it's already uh, made more money than both the Amazing Spider-Man films have combined in uh, the U.S. box office. So it's been doing pretty well. Now, now we get into uh, my pros and my cons. Now, there might be some spoilers and stuff like that. I'm not going over the synopsis. If you want a plot synopsis, you can go you know, other places for that. There were a decent amount of things that I liked about this movie. Um, there were things that I definitely appreciated about it a lot more after a second viewing. Um, I honestly am really impressed with Tom Holland. I would have to say after seeing this a uh, second time, as much as I liked Andrew Garfield, I got to give Tom Holland the, the, the edge. I got to give him the edge here. I think he is the best Spider-Man slash Peter Parker I've seen on film to date. He really did capture the spirit of both personalities and both personas really well. And uh, I think he's a great actor. He reminded me a lot of Michael J. Fox, a younger Michael J. Fox, which is actually really cool because I had always envisioned if there was a Spider-Man film made in the 80s, my dream casting would be Michael J. Fox as Peter Parker in Spider-Man. And Tom Holland kind of reminds me of Michael J. Fox in some ways with his mannerisms and his line delivery. So, I mean, that, that's actually a, a great thing. And he, you can tell he's very passionate about the role and he's got the quips down. He's got the personality down. He's got the charisma down. Um, yeah, uh, I think they finally got it right. Uh, and I'm actually looking, really looking forward to seeing what he's going to bring with the sequel how this how his uh, performance is going to evolve and how his character is going to evolve and so on. I also really liked Michael Keaton as a vulture. I thought he was killer. Uh, you know, as you all know, I love Michael Keaton. He's one of my all time favorite actors and he really does raise this film to a different level. Uh, he's another reason why I think the film is okay because he's such a strong villain. I would have to say he's one of the best villains in the MCU I've seen personally. Uh, and, uh, I really like this villain a lot, and I would also have to say this is the best Spider-Man villain I've seen on film, at least the best performance. And, I, and I, Alfred Molina I really liked as a Doc Ock, but it's in Spider-Man 2, but I didn't really care for the ending where he's like turns good or whatever. This, he remains villainous. He's still a bad guy. He has a purpose, and he has a goal that isn't necessarily evil, but at the same time, he doesn't have the right intentions. 
And overall, though, it's a very, I thought it was a pretty compelling villain. You actually did feel for him and his plight. Uh, he gets screwed over by the government and he's trying to uh, keep things together with his family. It, it's kind of similar to kind of what's going on with the Sandman dynamic in Spider Man 3, but it's handled so much better. Uh, in that one, it felt uh, sappy. It doesn't. It didn't feel sappy here. It actually felt uh, genuinely uh, real and gritty, and not necessarily gritty, but it, it actually did feel like okay, this the stakes were pretty high for this for the Vulture and and for Adrian Toomes, and uh, you, you you like I said, you sympathize with his plight, but at the same time, you know he had to be stopped. It was fun to see John Favreau again and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow as uh, Pepper Potts and uh, Tony Stark. You know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is great as always as Tony Stark. Marissa Tomei, I loved as Aunt May. I really wish she had more scenes in the film because some of the best scenes with Peter are scenes with Aunt May. Uh, Marissa Tomei and Tom Holland have wonderful chemistry with each other. And uh, I really wish that there was more scenes with them instead of all these fucking scenes with Ned, who's unfunny and is just annoying. But, you know, that's just, just me personally. I hope there's more sequences with uh, May and Peter in the sequel. And knowing how the movie ended, th yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot more uh, with those two in the sequel. That's for sure. Um... There's a few other, like, I liked uh, the actress who played Liz Allen. I, I thought she actually had some, she was sweet. Uh, her performance was, uh, I thought was really solid, especially for what she was asked to do. And overall, I, I really, I liked the dynamic. I liked the back and forth, uh, the, the chemistry that she had with Peter as well, with Tom Holland. Uh, I wish they had more scenes together too. Um, I wish the homecoming dance actually led to something because it just felt like okay it was it's just kind of a tease and kind of a padding it was just it was just pad the running time with this uh relationship this budding relationship with liz but never really go anywhere with it at least with the maiden spider-man with gwen stacy it actually goes somewhere with the relationship this just fizzles out and uh and that's really too bad because i thought her uh the actress Laura Harrier, uh, or Harrier, uh, she really was really well cast for the role. Now, a lot of the other, I, I would have to say in the casting, and I'll, actually I'll mention that later, because that's something I'll talk about in the negatives. Um, but yeah, in terms of the cast, that's pretty much the, the positives I have for the cast there. Um, those are the, those are the cast members that I enjoyed, I liked. I would have to say... When it comes to some of the sense of humor, uh, there were some moments that made me chuckle. Uh, mainly a lot of stuff in the scene where Spider-Man is trapped in this uh, storage facility and he's trying to, you know, pass the time. I thought the way they handled that was pretty well. The interrogation mode uh, uh, sequence uh, made me laugh. Um, there were a couple lines uh, that, uh, that Spider-Man had that made me smile. Uh, I also would say I, I really liked uh, this, the the scene, the the video, the home movies that Peter shot uh, during the events of Civil War, and then when he's trying to play back uh, what was recorded by his suit, there's a sh there's a little short uh, clip of him acting like he's Thor, and that made me laugh because that captured Spider-Man's personality and his sense of humor perfectly, uh, you know, so. He's, he's kind of a goof. So I, I really wanted... That was really nice to see. I hope there's more of that in the sequel. Um, so yeah, there were particular sequences I really liked. Uh, there was a really great twist that I didn't see coming at all. I'm not going to give it away. But it definitely did surprise me. If you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and there was a great scene where Michael Keaton is in the car... Uh, with Peter and he's talking to him and, and it's a really uh, tense sequence. It's really well shot and it has this sort of horror vibe to it and that's when it felt like John Watts was at his he was in he was in his comfort zone because uh, he's used to doing horror and that was actually really impressive. I wish the rest of the film was like that but I wanted to mention that scene because I thought it was actually a really well shot scene. 
uh, and, and well, it was a really well, well directed sequence as well. Um, I really like the soundtrack, uh, even Blitzkrieg Pop, which I've heard a million times. I, I that one actually grew on me. It actually fit Spider Man pretty well. It felt this, it, it fit the spirit of the character. Uh, the other soundtrack choices I thought were really good. The score, like I said, there were bits of it that I enjoyed by Michael Giacchino. And I would say the costume kind of, you know, that it it grew on me. I honestly would have liked to have seen more scenes with Tom in the suit instead of a CGI stunt double doing all of his stuff. Um, but the suit had some really cool stuff. Even, you know, I was kind of leery of the tech kind of thing because it's like Iron Man all over again. Uh, it's spider you know, Iron Spider, which actually is a real thing in the comics, and I've never been a fan of it. I don't like Iron Spider. And if that's the direction they're going to take Spider-Man in this series, I'm not going to be a fan of that. But anyway, there were some cool things like the spider drone that would pop off uh, uh, Spider-Man's chest and fly around and things like that. So there's some nice stuff. The gliders, the 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 webs that come out from underneath his uh, armpits and enable him to glide, which was one of the reasons why the Washington Monument scene was probably the strongest uh, action sequence, so to speak, out of the entire film for me. It actually had some pretty impressive shots. And, you know, visually, I mean... It definitely has a brighter look to it. it it's got a, a lighter tone uh, that actually that does fit Spider-Man pretty well. I'm just trying to think of other things, you know, that I liked about it. I don't want to leave stuff out. Really, that's kind of about it. That's really all that I can really think of over the top of my head about the things that I really liked about it. Um, the main things that I loved about the film were Tom Holland and uh, Michael Keaton their characters and their performances. Now we're getting to the things that I didn't like about the film or that I thought the film was lacking in. And one of the number one things is the direction. I thought John, well, I, I really do. I, I really hope someone else takes the reins for the sequel because I really do not think this guy is cut out for this type of film. He his comfort zone is in horror and suspense uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Tim Story, but like who directed the Fantastic Four movies, but like in an opposite sort of thing. Because Tim Story's never done horror, but what if think about it like this? Uh, John Watts is like a horror suspense director who's doing like a lighthearted family movie, and the it just doesn't seem like he's really in his comfort zone at all. It shows when he's not directing sequences with a horror slant to them. It's flat. The direction is flat. It, it's it's there's really not much to it. It's it's there's in a lot of movement, uh, and in the action sequences especially, it's severely lacking. Um, I don't know if the editing is to blame. That could be a prop. That could be an issue as well. But so is the you know the direction is you know could a good director can kind of uh, mask some questionable editing. And I don't feel John Watts is that great of a director. Um, especially with this type of movie. The action sequences were incredibly forgettable. Uh, ones that I liked, I thought were just okay. I mean, the Washington Monument sequence is the best sequence in terms of action for me personally. Uh, but other than that, it's kind of hard for me to really say anything else about it. I mean, I guess I, I did like, I, I forgot to mention this in the, in the pros and I want to mention it real quick. I liked the the bank robber the bank robbing scene. Uh, it was short but sweet, and it actually did feel like it was a comic book panel come to life, which is an example of maybe the type of direction that John Watts can actually excel at. But when it comes to action sequences with a vulture in in midair and these other things, it just felt a bit choppy. the The direction was a bit choppy, and there wasn't really a lot of energy there. It just felt like oh, it's just it didn't feel like he had put his own personal stamp on it. It just felt like he was going through the motions. He was going through the motions for me personally with a lot of the direction in this movie. Now, the script by six different writers is another problem. I mean, you have six writers and they, neither of them can really come up with a script that is really 
uh, a really standout screenplay. The story isn't really that particularly engaging. Uh, I don't mind the stakes being low, but um, it just feels like a lot of the action set pieces are like building up to something bigger, and then it never really happens. There's this this the climax is one of the, it's really anticlimactic, uh, climatic. It's one of the probably one of the most anticlimactic uh, climaxes I can think of in a Marvel film. It's just Spider-Man hanging on the side of an invisible jet, and it, he manages to avoid make it so the jet doesn't crash into the city. It crashes into the sand next to a fair. He gets in a brief scuffle with a vulture, where the vulture just pretty much hands him his ass, and then the vulture's wings are broken, and he tries to fly with it, what fly away with a crate, and the vulture crashes the ground, and Spider-Man captures him, webs him up, and leaves him for the police. It was just a very anticlimactic ending. It was just one of those, it was just a very, it was a big letdown. It was a huge letdown. Because it was like, oh, it felt like it was building up to some something big, and, and that never really happened. So, I mean, that that's, that's, I have to blame the script for that. That's, uh, that's all in the screenplay. I don't know which one of the six writers decided that yeah, let's build and build and then have like a, a weak ass climax. But uh, whoever it was, I mean, they made a mistake. The, the, uh, so I, it just reminded me a little bit too much of the climax in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man film. The first one where Goblin just kicks Peter's ass for the majority of the fight at the end. And then his spider sense man is, is warns him of the Goblin glider and he gets out of the way and it stabs Willem Dafoe stabs the goblin and that's how the fight ends. Now, so yeah, I mean, that ties into the script. I think the quips could have been a lot better. Some of them made me chuckle, but I've yet to see a Spider-Man film where Spider-Man is just shooting off rapid fire quips that are just having me rolling in laughter. Spider-Man is the precursor to Deadpool folks. Before Deadpool, there was Spider-Man, and they still haven't gotten it right. I don't understand. How hard can it be? You had six writers. Uh, maybe all six don't have that great of a sense of humor. Because when you have Spider-Man sliding on his ass behind a truck, and he's saying lines like, Ow, my butt. I mean, th that just seems pretty lazy screenwriting, especially for lines for Spider-Man to say. Um... There's a few moments, but overall, I mean, even the interrogation mode scene, what was what was funny it wasn't anything that Spider-Man was saying, it was how he was saying it. So it's one of those things that's like, hire some comic writers or something who know how to really know Peter and know his sense of humor, because I still have yet to see it on a, consi on a consistent basis on film. I saw the closest as he made in Spider-Man 2, but it's still not as consistent as it could be. And by consistent, I mean consistently funny. For a film that has this sort of comedy vibe to it, it really isn't that funny. And that ties into the just absolutely abhorrent character of Ned. Whose bright idea was it to give Spider-Man a nerdy fucking sidekick who just won't shut the fuck up? Where nothing about this character leads me to believe that he should be friends with Peter, let alone be his uh, guy in the chair? Because... because Really, you you see the relationship between these two uh, when Peter accidentally reveals his identity to Ned because he's in his room one night. He then lets him tag along with him and Ned is just being an annoying fucking gnat he, that Spider-Man should fucking eat or web up, <laughs> you know, get him to shut the fuck up. Uh, it was just one of those things. It's like he's all talking about the stupid shit, you know, like, do you lay eggs? Do you do do do? Do you know Captain America? Do you know blah blah blah? It just won't shut up. And even Spider Man, even Peter's like, Ned, shut up, shut up. And he, he's not listening to him. He's continuously just asking these fucking questions. And Peter is clearly giving him multiple clues. He's telling him to shut up, and he won't shut up. Yeah, that's a great friend. A guy who's just continuously asking him all these fucking questions, and and he w won't listen to his friend, best friend, who's telling him to shut up. Uh, the scene in the party where Ned pretty much, because Peter 
thinks that I'm just going to go as myself. And Ned pretty much insults Peter to his face by saying, you know, well, you're not that cool or something like that. I'm like, what a dick. I mean, like, why is he friends with this guy? Anyway, Ned is a character who should have been a side character who's a part of the decathlon team who had like a few lines. That's it. He should not have dominated the film as much as he did. He looks and acts like a your typical Disney Channel sitcom fat funny friend. If you've seen a Disney Channel sitcom, you know what I'm talking about. He's the prototypical fat funny kid from the Disney Channel. And it reeks of Disney Channel casting. It reeks of Disney meddling. It reeks of Disney being like, hey, we have Spider-Man and we know he's really popular on Disney XD with the cartoon. We need to get our Disney uh, tween fan base to really latch on to this film. Let's throw in a fat, nerdy gamer kid, uh, you know, like we have in all of our toxic uh, sitcoms in here. It really did feel like that. And they also had Zendaya, who was in uh, other Disney Channel stuff. She was, she's in this. So it's one of those things where, you know, her character, MJ, I don't know why they had that line in there that was pointless and was just honestly pretty insulting. It's like, why would you do that? Like, if she's not really supposed to be Mary Jane, why would you have Call Me MJ? It's dumb. You didn't even need to do that. That was just unnecessary. It was, an unnes unnes it was an unnecessary slap in the face by the screenwriters. And speaking of slaps in the face, I want to slap Ned across the face 50 fucking times. Wipe that fucking smirk off his face. Anyway, I just, I hate this fucking character. I, I wanted to boil him in a fucking pit of lava. Like, this is a character that it just represents everything I fucking hate about a character. He's fucking annoying. There's nothing likable about him. He just feels like he's just planted into this story just because. And also, it takes a lot away from Peter. Peter's supposed to be the super genius, and he, he can't figure out this stuff on his own. He has to have a fucking nerdy, fat uh, sidekick. He has to have a fat fuck, nerdy kid uh, do a lot of his uh, tech work for him. Come on. And then there's a scene near the end where he's fighting the shocker, in the in the you know in the in the parking lot where there's a bunch of school buses, and Peter gets his ass saved by Ned. Like what? Like well, why is Spider-Man getting his ass saved by his fucking fat sidekick, this nerdy Ned? Why is he getting saved by nerdy Ned? Yes, it was a distraction so Spider-Man could finally web up Shocker. But really, come on, Spider-Man can't be the Shocker by himself. I know he doesn't have his suit, the super suit. Excuse me, just talking about Ned is just making my allergies act up because I'm allergic to his fucking bullshit and his fat ass. But anyway, it, like, Spider-Man can't be the Shocker by himself, and that's another problem. Spider-Man looks pretty fucking weak in this movie. He doesn't really do that much of the Vulture he isn't able really to defeat the Shocker on his own. He has to have help by Nerdy Ned. Um, it was just one of those things where Spider-Man also appears like he's a Captain Klutz throughout a lot of the movie, which isn't really the best look. Uh, that's another problem I have with the script. Like, I, I, I'm fine with growing pains, but to me there's a little bit too much growing pains. At this point, Spider-Man's supposed to have been crime-fighting for a while, and he's like doing shit like trying to prevent a guy from getting back into his own car, uh, grabbing a bike, and away, taking a bike away from some guy who stole it and then can't find who whose owner it is and leaves a note. It's very just kind of like, you know, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man stuff, and that's fine. But it just felt like very small potato stuff. And I would think by this point, he would have already fought somebody like the Shocker. I think that would have been a better idea. Have him fight the Shocker early on in the film instead of the montage where the Stan Lee cameo that was really lame and you know the stuff where he's looks like a total dweeb where he doesn't know what he's doing like webbing up some guy who's trying to get back into his own car you know it was just me personally I think they could have done a better job establishing Spider-Man as a legitimate hero and a legitimate uh, force to be reckoned with which he is this was just a lot of, you know, 
just didn't seem like he was really as capable as he should have been. I mean, the climax, he's, dri he's driving around in a stolen car instead of web-slinging to the location. So, yeah, it was just... I really think that they really could have done a better job with that. Also, where the hell is his spider sense? Why are you getting rid of his spider sense? Because that's one thing I definitely noticed. He has absolutely no spider sense in this movie. Why? Why can't Peter have a spider sense? Why are you taking away his spider sense? This is one of the coolest things, one of his best abilities. Why would you take that away? That's something that's definitely, I, I have to definitely mention that. Yeah, Ned is one of my number one problems with this movie. He's a fucking character of Ned. Um, and the some of the sense of humor in general. It just it, and also the tone. Yeah, it's got a lighter tone, but it also has scenes that kind of break out of it, like uh, the vulture shooting some guy with an energy beam and disintegrating him. Teenagers at the school playing a game of fuck Mary kill with Thor, the Hulk, and I believe Spider Man or some other uh, hero. Uh, Zendaya's flipping the middle finger um, in one scene, which I'm like, well. Which kind of upset because I'm like I hate that character. She's this typical like edge lord character who has no personality other than oh what's up like I'm an edgy character. I'm so edgy. It's just very unlikable. Everything that that everything that she was doing was just a total try hard uh, affair, and I didn't buy at all. I didn't buy it. it just. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the tone. I mean, you got, like, fuck, Mary kill, people getting disintegrated, middle fingers, a fucking joke where Ned gets cornered by a teacher in the computer lab later in the film while he's the guy in the chair, and he's all like, and the, and the teacher's like, what are you doing in here? You know, there's a dance. Um, I was, I was looking up porn. A porn joke? What's up with these, 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 like, superhero comic book films for for teenagers this year that have to have fucking dick jokes or, or sex jokes in them power rangers had like a dick i had a dick joke in the beginning like a bull semen joke and now we have like a, a porn joke i mean i just like what is up with that i mean that, that's a really strange blend to me uh, it's it, it just doesn't really work. It is this tone shift, and I've heard things as trying to be like Ferris Bueller's Day Off or a John Hughes film. I don't really see it. This doesn't feel or look like a John Hughes movie. You can show a a, a little clip of Ferris Bueller's Day Off on a TV and some barbecue. And Spider Man flies through in one scene. That doesn't mean it's a John Hughes film. You can have Zendaya. Hanging out in detention doesn't doesn't mean it's the Breakfast Club or even in the same league. I don't think I don't think the writers or the director tried hard enough to try to make this feel like a John Hughes high school movie with Spider Man. I just I didn't really it just felt kind of artificial when they did try to do that, at least for me personally. And yeah, the action sequences were pretty lackluster. The climax it sucked. And really, that's kind of, those are the main negatives for me. It's the story. I thought the story could have been more interesting. The high school stuff wasn't that interesting. The, the, the most tolerable, the most tolerable uh, it got for me was uh, in the montage scene where uh, Peter's getting ready, you know, to go to homecoming with Aunt May. I was getting ready to go with uh, Liz, but um, Aunt May is helping him learn how to put on a tie and tie a tie and things like that. Excuse me, just clearing my throat there for a sec. That one, that was a good scene. I like that scene once. And that was as close as it got. Like It, it was just montages that had nice songs in the background. Other than that, the, the high school stuff, just I didn't care about the decathlon I didn't give a shit about the other high school drama. And I was really worried about that. And I think that's gonna be, that could be an issue going forward. Because this is just something that's been done to death in the Spider-Man franchise. In the comics and in the animated series. You know, 
there's really not much else you can really do that could be unique or different. And as unique as they get is having it be this just fantasy high school for gifted teens that is just the most culturally diverse high school you will ever see in your life. To the point where it honestly was pretty comical. It was like, yeah, this, this this reeks of somebody who was like, yeah, we need to make this as inclusive as possible. So let's have like everybody of every race and all this other stuff. It just it, it kind of got distracting at, at times. It was just, it kind of took me out of the film. It's like it was clearly there was just a lot of just we need to be diverse for the sake of being diverse casting. It, it definitely felt like that was the case with Flash. Flash didn't need to be like some uh, middle. I don't know if he's Middle Eastern or he's Indian. Either way, he didn't need to be of a different race. I think would have been would have been nice to see a jock type character in this environment who was actually smart. You know, that would have been interesting instead of just another nerdy kid who re really doesn't who slaps Peter on the ass. I guess I guess that's his bullying, slapping Peter on the ass. But um. Yeah, the high school stuff, you know, I could kind of take it or leave it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's those are pretty much the negatives for me. There's a few, like, things that were just meh, like the editing and the cinematography, uh, the visual effects for the time. You know, I mean, not for the time. I mean, the visual... F <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of different movies. But the visual effects for uh, the budget were pretty good. Um, I like the look of the vulture. I wish the sequences with the Vulture were shot better and edited better because there's a lot of quick cut bullshit. There's quick cut editing that, honestly, I'm sick and tired of. But, yeah, I mean, that that's those those are my cons. And now we get to my final rating. Um, I know it's a pretty long review, but there's a lot of stuff I kind of want to talk about. Um, Like I said, overall, I think it's okay. I think it's an all right film. I liked it all right. Um, it's kind of a rambling sort of review because, you know, there's there's... Things that I liked about it, things that I didn't. Um, and overall, that's why I find it to be okay. I think it's all okay. I liked the film. I didn't love it. I said I was all right. Um, I, I, I didn't think it was as great as a lot of critics said it was. But hey, you know, that's just me personally. If you like the film, uh, if, you th if you love the movie, I think that's awesome. Like I've said many times before, that's proof that we're still living in a very interesting place. And... Um, I really appreciate and respect your opinion, but you know, my opinion, I just, I didn't think it sucked or anything. I didn't hate the movie. I just thought it was all right. I thought it was okay. Um, I, I, I think it's a, a decent building block, a decent step forward for the franchise. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they're going to do next. Like what Tom Holland's going to do next with uh, Peter and Spider-Man and, and what the sequel is going to be like. And, and, what direction they're going to take this franchise anyway thanks for watching uh my review and if you didn't know what i meant by okay you know rating out of five stars three out of five stars because that's 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 the kind of rating i give for movies i think are all right that i like okay and yeah three out of five stars that's my rating i hope you guys enjoy the review uh i hope it was worth the wait and as always i will see you guys later See ya.